An excerpt from Mise en Place by Danielle Ackley MacPhail. The butcher was late, as were half her kitchen staff and all the servers. Each time someone did arrive, fresh whiffs of smoke accompanied them, stronger and stronger as time passed. Erskine looked up from preparing the dashi for her signature dish and frowned. What is going on out there? Mishi remained silent, avoiding her gaze, but his grip tightened on his knife. Ami, one of the servers who had just arrived, came forward, her face pale and her hands tormenting the strings of her apron. There are fires burning below. Mother says it's just bad luck and old buildings, but I heard on the way here that General Razendar and his men have entered the city. Turning down the flame on the dashi, Erskine headed out to the balcony once more, wiping her hands on her apron as she went. Through the ringing in her ears, she heard the kitchen staff scrambling to follow. Mishi kept pace with her, just at her back, the others strung out behind him like crumbs swept from the table. Normally, she would order all of them back to their stations, but right now, her only focus was getting to the railing. Her hands gripped the marble balustrade as she looked out over the terrace cliffs of the city. She grimaced as her gaze automatically traveled to where her family's home lay, but she could not quit her relief. The houses there were undisturbed, though a smoky haze hung heavy over the neighborhood adjacent to the docks, with tendrils spreading over the city on the breeze. There were no other signs of disturbance that she could see. While there had been talk of dissension in nearby regions and movement of military forces from distant lands, that was hardly anything new. She didn't put any store by it. People loved to speculate, especially the more common folk. And she should know. She'd grown up as common as could be. Nothing had ever come of the gossip the women told over the market aisles or the men shared on their front stoops. Not then and not now. Enough foolishness. She had meal service to prepare and a reputation for excellence to uphold. As she entered the kitchen, her eye went towards the access staircase leading to the roof. The smoke particles filling the air outside could cause them power issues. Tamias, Kath, go up to the rooftop and make sure the solar panels are clear of ash then prep the balcony for service. Erskine ordered the idle bus boys. The rest of you, back to work. Hearsay will not shut down this kitchen today. Choruses of Yes, Chef followed in her wake as she returned to her cooking. The butcher never did arrive. Neither did any of the night's reservations, or even casual diners. Erskine threw down the towel she used to clean her cook surface in disgust and glowered around the kitchen. Such waste. No point in standing here all night, she told her staff. Wrap and store everything that we'll keep for tomorrow. Toss the rest on the compost heap. Mishi frowned and opened his mouth as if he would speak, but closed it. The others just muttered, yes, chef, and all proceeded to do her bidding. She turned to her sous chef. Sometimes she forgot they were contemporaries, but now he watched her with a man's judgment, and she bristled. You wish to say something? His lips pressed together, and his eyes darkened as if he debated with himself on the wisdom of speaking. Then he straightened ever so slightly beneath her gaze and gave a nod. Yes, chef. Please, might the leavings go to the soup kitchen? I would be glad to take them. As your day's wages, she interrupted him. He grimaced at that, disappointment in his gaze as he shook his head. She felt a hint of shame kindled by his expression. She quickly smothered it, then went on the offensive. I paid good money for those provisions. If I do not recoup that cost one way, she said, gesturing towards the empty dining room, I must another. The leavings will go on the compost heap. At least then I'll gain value from the food we grow from it. Understood? He looked as if he would say more, but only nodded before turning away to wrap and stow the materials on his station, his shoulders lifting in a silent sigh. 
She thought that was the end of it. But he took a deeper breath and straightened once more before turning back to her. There is value in showing goodwill to those around you, in helping those in need. He then turned back to his task without waiting for her to respond. Erskine frowned deeper, vexed that his opinion should matter to her. She had believed as he did once, until her mentor Savon nearly ended her career over such an act of kindness. Erskine was about to send the staff home early when the bell on the front door sounded. All eyes snapped to the swinging doors, but no one moved. Moments later, the hostess, Elise, entered the kitchen. You, your presence is requested on the balcony, chef, she said, her expression neutral but her gaze panicked. Before any of the others could move, Erskine silently motioned them to stay back, including Elise. She then stripped off her spattered apron and smoothed her hair before pushing through the swinging doors. With dignity, she wended her way past too many empty tables as she headed for the balcony, seething inside at the waste of her time and resources. While she hated to give credence to rumors, Erskine's steps faltered for a heartbeat as she passed through the glass pane doors. She hated it even worse when rumors were true. Seated just beneath the pergola, with a clear view of the city, was a host of men in military garb. Hanging braziers took the chill off the night as they lit the four hastily combined tables, glinting off the cutlery as well as a dizzying variety of medals and satin campaign ribbons, all of them meaningless to Erskine. The man most decorated bore signs of Truktini's ancestry, a square jaw, painfully high cheekbones, and narrow eyes, to go with his hairless head. Razin Dar stood as Erskine approached and greeted her with arms spread. Ah, the acclaimed Chef Levo, at last. Gratifying as that may have been from anyone else, Erskine knew not to trust such an informal greeting from this infamous man. If she were to believe his reputation, there were layers to his intentions, and they often lacked in veracity. Erskine halted just out of reach, and with her arms straight at her sides, accorded him a brief but respectful bow. "'Gentlemen, how may I serve you tonight?' she asked cordially acknowledging the general's dozen or so subordinates while she thought on what could be made quickly and in sufficient quantity with the ingredients left in the larder. May I recommend our cheese board and fresh bread, followed by the dashi with miso black cod and greens, paired with our house blend matcha and ginger infused white wine, and a clarified lemon souffle with honey gastrique to finish. Most of the men looked at her with blank gazes clearly not having the faintest knowledge of fine dining. Razin Dar looked only slightly less lost, but covered it well with a faint mew. No bourbon custard with oatmeal tweel and candied basil, he asked. Her eyes widened, and she nearly clutched the chair back in front of her. That was her dish, but not one she had ever served at Erskine. Very few were familiar with it, all of them far away in Andalise, where she perfected the recipe. Hiding her discomfort behind a demure smile, she pressed her hands together and briefly inclined her head. I'm afraid not. I can offer a rice flour chocolate tort with rose petal and pistachio brittle if the souffle does not suit. In the guise of waiting for his reply, she examined the general. She knew of him his face, his exploits, the darker rumors, who did not. But she had never served him that she was aware. Of course, in the years she traveled the many lands of Pangaea, learning her craft the hard way, she had never enjoyed such status as she did today. This man should not know enough to connect her with a dish another had taken credit for. No matter, though. However he knew, he knew and that made her rather uncomfortable. Razindar had sought out her restaurant for a purpose, and it wasn't merely to share a meal with his men. 
suppressing a shudder. She could stand there no more. Gentlemen, if you'll excuse me, I shall return to the kitchen to prepare your first course while you decide. Please inform Elise as to your choice of dessert. As she turned to leave, she noticed fresh plumes of smoke darkening the twilight over the city, and could not help but gasp softly. She would never forget the smug look on Razindar's face as he heard her. <laughs>